a lot of time that we can discuss. <laughs> Let's try to make a quick run through this paper. Uh, we may do it a bit fast, but uh, well, let's try to finish that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, um, right. So, uh, you remember the last class that was in this um, We we were talking large elements, planar diagrams, and so on. Okay. okay. So, uh, you remember the rule. The rule was that to leading order in large N, a theory without fundamental matter, only adjoints, um, receives contributions only from planar diagrams, genus G diagrams. More precisely, the rule was that uh, graphs of genus G were weighted by a relative factor, uh, 1 over N to the power 2G. Okay? And uh, uh, the, the second rule was that an index, every whole, every index, a fundamental index loop, uh, was weighted by a factor of 1 over n, rather than 1 over n squared. Okay? So adding, adding extra handles to the surface, or adding extra holes to the surface, are both subdominant in the 1 over n expansion. Okay? Now, um, of course, doing the whole 1 over n expansion is, of course, very interesting. But uh, to be able to have any chance of doing that, you have to be able to solve a theory in the large element. Uh, we have many examples of theories we did solve a theory in the large element. Matrix integral, then we did matrix quantum mechanics. Um, uh, but now we're in one plus one dimensions. And we want to know whether we can take, we can get a non-trivial theory, a theory which is propagated to this freedom, and solve it in the large element. Uh, this problem was addressed by Thoth. Um, you know, Thoth. The great theoretical physicist of Thoth went through a fantastically creative period between 1970 and 1984. So, each wrote maybe 30 papers, but just you know individually outstanding. Each paper, you know, you're a bit proud of it. So. And uh, but he did 30 of them. So, <laughs> okay. So you, you may have heard of him mainly for the normalizability of pH theorems and so on. But he's many, many things. Okay, many, many things that. And this, this, this little paper is a little gem. You know, it's a kind of paper you could write in three days if you are there. As you will see, there's no, there's nothing to it. Uh, but so it's so nice. Okay. So, so what, uh, what I thought did was to study the following. Okay. Um, study the model cyber B slash plus uh, side. Okay, uh, in, in one plus one dimension. So, what's this model? The model is a model of fermions, okay, coupled to a yak. Okay, now he allowed for these fermions to have a certain number of flavors. Okay, um, so firstly, these fermions were in the fundamental n dimension. Fundamentals, the n dimensional representation of the planet. We'll generalize to adding fla flavors a little later, but now imagine that there's only one. Okay, there's only one. Okay. So, uh, the question about this model is uh, what is physics? Now, suppose you were to treat this in free field theory. Okay. In free field theory, what would the answer Meaning, ignore, key take this action, truncate it to quadratic level. Okay? And then quadratic that. So, at quadratic level, you would get, uh, uh, you would get the quadratic part of x mu f mu. But the quadratic part of f mu f mu, or f mu f mu by itself, as, as we have seen before, has no degrees of freedom. Right? We argued this in the one of our dimensions. The gauge theory, the gauge theory has no degrees of freedom. We saw this many different ways. Right? Okay. Uh, in general, we saw that in d dimensions, the field has d minus 2 to propagate it. So, freedom. So, two dimensions. But no, no propagating. So, at quadratic level, you will see that there's no, no propagating degrees of freedom. Yeah. But if you looked at this, you would just get free fermions. And free fermions 
have fun, you know, it's a freedom. So you would think that there would be one uh, um, or an independent, if you want, in the UN, the fundamental, which controls everything. And for me, I don't think it's a freedom. This one. Okay? Um, so, if you were to do a to free field theory, you would guess that the spectrum of the theory would be a Hilbert space made up of Fox space of n, n for n guns, and then perhaps corrected with some interactions. This is totally the wrong answer. Okay. And actually, that is the wrong answer we can see quite intuitively, even, even classically, uh, as opposed to four dimension space. It's harder to say it's intuitively classically. But we come to that later. For now, what we want to do is to just work in the larger element and try to see if we can just solve this theory without dividing intuition. It's just mathematically solve the theory and try to get the answer. For the spectrum. Okay? Fine. So, uh, so how are we going to do this? So, uh, now, the first thing that Toph does when analyzing this, uh, this model is to set a gauge. Okay, so first I'm going to define the notation. So we're in two dimensions with two Lorentzian dimensions. We've got two coordinates in Lorentzian dimensions and time and space. Okay. And uh, we will define uh, x plus minus d uh, x x plus minus d by square. Okay? Yes, this whole thing is a covariant. This d, d slash is d plus i d. Okay? Yeah. So this is what makes it, of course, an interaction. The, the, the interactions between the between the covariants and each Which, as you say, it's crucial. Okay. Now, so we we work in light cone coordinates. So x plus minus x plus minus d, and uh, uh, with the lower index. So suppose we take the momentum, for instance, plus minus. That is equal to. Yeah, okay, right. Right. Uh, is equal to. Uh, Okay, let me switch to Let me switch to this notation. Sorry. So he calls this x. What I call x is called x one. What I call t calls it x zero. Okay. X plus minus is equal to x one plus minus x zero. That changes nothing. But then p plus minus is equal to p one plus minus p zero. Where p zero P lower zero is minus of P upper zero. Right? We're using the, the metric is minus one one time and space. Okay? So I've not changed this is plus minus, so is this, but this P zero is the lower component, which makes if you write it in terms of P upper zero to be P1, P upper 1, minus plus P upper 0. Okay? Fine. So, just like P, we can, for the gauge field, we can define A plus is equal to A1 plus minus A0 by square root 2. And now, the point is this. What we can do is to try to solve the path and the integral of the theory. Try to solve the theory, A working in a particular gauge. Okay? And the gauge that Tom chose for this problem was the gauge A plus, what's it, A minus? A minus. A minus equals A plus. Now, you people remember that when we call the path integral for the gauge theory, um, we, to make sense of the path integral, 
this with algorithm D, we needed to insert an delta function. Okay, uh, the fixed gauge, uh, but associated with the delta function was a Hadi power determinant. Okay, and uh, no, the determinant when c bar times c times what came in here was the uh, transformation of the thing that you set to zero under a gauge transformation. Okay? So the thing that we set to zero here is A minus. So we need to know how A minus transforms. Okay? Uh, this C, okay, so the general rule was that we got some condition. Okay? That condition is a matrix condition. Okay? Uh, under gauge transformation, it transforms in some way involved in some gauge transformation capital L. So the general rule was that the Fadi uh, Papa determinant take this expression, multiply it by C bar and trace uh, and replace lambda by C. Remember, it's just the determinant of this. Okay, so uh, how does A minus change under, um, under a gauge transformation? Okay. So the change in A minus is L minus lambda plus I A minus A minus complete L. Right? The change under an infinitesimal gauge transformation. But the covariant derivative of the gauge transformation parameter. Change of A. Okay. But you remember this is happening when we've inserted inside the path of angle delta of A minus. So A minus in particular is zero. Okay? So this term can be forgotten about. Because you're doing a path and tangle along with the delta function. It tells you that A minus is zero. You remember, you remember the case procedure. And therefore, the full Fadi Popov determinant is just C bar del minus C. Or the determinant of the operator D minus. Now the important point for the, this, this Fadi Popov determinant is that it does not involve any one, any or side. It does not involve the gauge fields or the fermionic fields at all. So this is specific for this gauge. For this gauge. Yes. Yes. Uh, let me contrast this by the, I'll contrast this to what happens in the Lorentz scale. I'll do that in a moment. But because it does not involve any of the uh, fermions at all, the path integral over C just gives you some overall number. Does not affect any computation of correlation functions, anything like that. And if we're interested in the path integral up to an undefined normalization, we can just forget it. Okay, so this is one of the great things about this gauge or any such gauge, any gauge in which you set particular component of A to Z. There are no ghosts in that gauge. Okay, now, uh, Sir, uh, is there any particular advantage of using because I mean apparently it looks like this trivial. I mean, uh, the you are just setting it the gauge field to zero and then you are obviously getting some number and then you are just ignoring it. So is there any underlying uh, advantage of Well, you know, you want to make life as simple as you can. So you're doing this in a way uh, that see okay. Let me reinterpret it. Uh, advantage it looks like there are a lot of advantages. Right? So you set something to zero. But let me let me reword your question. You could ask a question, why is this a particularly useful thing? Uh, as you might know, this gauge is rarely used in analysis of four dimensional okay? However, this gauge is extremely useful in analysis of two dimensional things. And you could ask why. And that is the, for the following reason. You see this F mu mu is A mu commutator A mu. Sorry, it's D mu A mu minus D mu A mu. Plus with some i, the new computer is. Right? Now, in two dimensions, there are only two possible a, mu's and mu's. If you set one of them to zero, then this commutator term vanishes. Okay? The commutator term vanishes, 
and therefore the uh, f mu nu squared, I mean the, the self interaction of the gauge field become effectively quadratic. This would not be true with any other gauge. Because if you have, let's say, three A's, you set one of them to zero, you can still get the commutator of the other two. So doing this is extremely advantageous in this dimension. Now you can ask, everything I said, both the lack of Fadi Popo determinant as well as the killing of self interactions of the gauge field, would have been true of, let's say, A0 is equal to zero, or A1 equal to zero. You can ask, why do I choose uh, uh, the uh, light code gauge? This is because it retains boost in that is, you know, as you know, under boosts, uh, under a boost, a minus, let's say, transform rate is far minus plus rate. Are you, are you familiar with this? Uh, uh, I'm saying something more or less true. Suppose, uh, let, let's re recall the Lorentz transformations. The Lorentz transformations are x0 prime, in particular, in some x0 prime, is equal to say, cosh theta x0 plus sine h beta x1. And uh, uh, x1 prime is equal to cosh beta x1 plus sine h beta x0. Where beta, you, you know this notation? B, uh, beta is uh, tan beta is v equals is v equals. Yeah. You're familiar with this, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but that doesn't matter. Okay, fine. Now let's see what this means for x zero plus x one. For x zero plus x one, right? How does that drop? Well, um, we will get <coughs> x0 is equal to x0 plus x1 into, sorry, x0 plus x, x0 into cos beta plus sin beta plus x1 into cos beta plus sin So it's x0 plus s1 into cos plus sin h. Now what is cos plus sin h? Oh, okay, similarly, if you work on x0 minus x1, right, this is equal to x0 minus x1, and if you minus beta, you get cos minus h. Okay? So, uh, the great thing about these light cone components is that they transform homogeneously at most. You see, if you work in 0 and 1, you get a mixture of 0 and 1 in the right hand side. But if you look at these light cone points, you just rescale the light cone points. Hmm. x plus stretches out, x minus stretches in. Now, Lorentz transformation has acted in, in the same way with any object with, same, with similar index structures. Okay? So this is true for x0, uh, x plus, and x minus, it's also true for a plus and a plus. <coughs> okay? And therefore, this gauge a minus is equal to zero is boosted by it. Set a minus equal to zero in one Lorentz frame. That's equivalent to setting a minus equal to zero in any other Lorentz frame. All right. So you retain more of the symmetries of the problem <laughs> by doing this than you would by setting a zero a one to zero, which is always an advantage. I've swept some trees in front of the copy. Doesn't matter. Uh, all right. Now I should caution you about one thing here. And the caution is that um, look, we've not been very careful about what we've done. Because setting a minus equal to zero does not completely fix gauge. It does not fix those gauge transformations that are functions only of x plus. Because under the gauge transformation, a minus changes by like del minus of something. Del minus of any function of x plus is zero, function of only x plus is zero. 
Therefore, any gauge transformation is a function of D of x plus. This is not fixed by this gauge. So this is a residual gauge in that case. And if you try to fix that residual gauge in that case, life will get quite complicated. Right? Uh, now, you see, doing complicated problems in physics is basically an art. Okay, so uh, Toft has a good taste to ignore, ignore the problem. Just proceed and see what came about. Okay. Uh, after him, about 500, this paper has been cited, maybe I People have gone and filled in the details. Tomes of work, justify everything he's done. Okay. We're going to follow him. Okay. Forget it. Forget this unfixed gauge invariance. Small thing. Usually, if ignoring something matters, you will see it in your calculation. You'll see a divergence. And you will see we run into some issues. Okay. So what we're going to do is before that just just those original paper and not try to worry too much about that. Please follow our nose and see where we come. Okay. So we ignore the fact that some unfixed gauge then just proceed. If the unfixed gauge in then was really bad, by the way, it would show itself in the propagator not being inverted. Because that would make problem with gauge Make the propagator not being inverted. So unless we run into problems with invertibility, non-invertibility of the propagator. Okay? We're going to not worry about things too much. This is a hit and miss approach that can sometimes hit you badly. If it works, it works very well. <laughs> okay. Fine. By the way, we do the same thing in Lorenz's gauge. We ignore unfixed gauge invariance, at least in Euclidean space. There's a usually quantum field theories are so complicated then to think through every last subtle thing and try to solve a point of view is a real, realistically an un unfeasible task. <laughs> What's feasible? Maybe but only once you know this. <laughs> and you know, that's part one difference between physics and mathematicians. You proceed, right? Make sense of it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you know, so in that spirit, we fix this gauge in this gap. Now, once we fix this gauge, as we said, there are no self interactions in the gauge. Okay, um, there are. Has the theory become purely non interactive? No, it's what you said. There's a psi bar, psi e interaction. So there are interactions. But the theory is much simplified diagrammatically. So that's giving all the diagrams that contribute. So let's try to imagine a particular observer. The observer we will look at, well, it's not quite the observer. The thing we're going to try to compute in this case to start with is the propagator of the effort being field. Okay. Now see, in an arbitrary gauge, what kind of diagram should compute? All right, we work at helium. We should we should be worrying only about planar diagrams. Okay, we don't want the gauge fields to. Now, now arbitrary theory is what we could have done for all kinds of groups. We could, for instance, have worked about this. Where there's a new formula group. We could have worked about graphs like this. Now, if we're really interested in leading order and larging, we're not going to allow the group index groups to fundamentally index groups. Because they suppress by the as we argued. Alright? So we're not going to allow any new fermion to pop up. Anywhere in this final graph. Such graph, such graph. But in an arbitrary gauge, this would still be a hell of a job compute to some of these different graphs. You know, some crazy mess. You compute it. But you start using new variable. Okay, but what's special about our gauge? Special about our gauge is that no, no gauge goes on self interactions. Okay, so in our gauge, what graphs can be? Well, we can have a graph like this, we can have another graph like this, and it will be encircled by something like this. Another graph, another graph, encircled by another guy. 
What? What rainbow diagrams? But these are quite similar to the diagrams. Okay? Now we encountered this class of diagrams before. Can somebody remind me where we can come to this class? What? In the English there. Except the large end limit of uh, the scalar theory in three dimensions. Remember, we solved that, and we found that uh, not exactly this, it was like diagrams like this, but very similar classes of diagrams got created. Okay? And we used the same method to solve that problem that we're going to use here. Actually, then we used two or three different methods, and we could use the same thing. Yeah, I'm just going to look at the diagram. You see, all of these graphs, whatever they do, are assumed to give you a self-energy correction for the Fermi. Now, any graph here that is separated by a fermion line that's something else, that just is taken care of in the geometric product. So the self-energy is just all graphs that cannot be cut by cutting a single fermion. So what we are interested in something of all such to get out of this. Okay? So sigma which is the self energy. I'm going to write down the answer first without any i's and minus signs. Okay? Then I'll just look at the over here. Okay, okay, you can do that. Okay. Okay. So sigma is what? You see, all such graphs have the feature that there is an overlying Enveloping thing. And inside is whatever you want. If you look at the set of all such graphs, you see all the sum of the graphs that contribute to the set energy, every one of them has an over overlying guy here. Because if it didn't, then there would be a way of cutting. And inside is whatever you want. But inside being whatever you want means that this is the exact propagator. The propagator along with the self energy. Okay, see. So, that's it. We've got this guy for all outside. And here we could have. Each of these by itself yeah. is arbitrary, so it's a self energy connection. So it's free propagator, self energy, free propagator, self energy, free propagator, self energy. What is that? That's exact propagator. So, let me say this again. What is the self energy connection? It's the term that you add to the effective action, the quadratic term that you add to the effective action. The exact propagator is what you get when you invert the quadratic term, including the bare part, plus the self energy. Exactly. So, if now you write down an equation and you tell me, yeah, this makes sense. Let's call the momentum of this R to follow. Uh, let's call it. Okay? And let's call this. The momentum that goes in here, P minus. And then the momentum that goes in here, okay? Now, so what I want to do is to find a formula of sigma of P. Okay. So, sigma of P of course is a matrix. Because, uh, I mean, a matrix in the spinner space. Can be what's added to the quadratic term for the Fermi on. Okay, so to, uh, what is sigma of p? Well, here there is an interaction matrix, but the only non-zero a was a lower plus or a, a upper minus. So that comes with a gamma minus. This is gamma minus. Now, then. There is this propagator. 
This propagator is what? Let's look at f mu nu squared. Because a minus is the only, uh, so a plus is the only non zero, right? L minus a plus the whole thing squared. So the only propagating gauge field is a plus, because there's only one gauge field left in our gauge. What is this propagator? 1 over p minus. 1 over p minus squared. Up to some i's and minus signs, we won't try to get straight. Okay? So this guy is 1 over p minus k minus squared. What about this? This is the fermion propagator. The fermion propagator, but including sigma. And therefore, this is I P I K slash plus n plus plus of k. Okay. What does k? Have to be, k can be anything. Okay, so up to some plus minus signs, some highs, some factors, which you have to be a little careful about getting straight, but that in the end is horsework. You know that, it's easy to know. Okay, this is the equation. Is this totally clear? Uh, so this is one thing I have already reached it. Like, what is this gamma minus thing? Uh, Sorry, and I forgot another gamma minus. There's a gamma minus here. There's, there's an intrench here. There's an intrench. Gamma minus is, is, the, is the vertex. You see, let's, let's look at it. See, what was the interaction vertex? The interaction vertex was gamma, gamma minus. So another way of saying this is so that what we're doing is contracting this as this. But with all interactions, that gives us this exact property. And we're contracting this as this. Also with all interactions. That, however, gives us just the bare A propagator. Why? Is the A, a propagator as an exact statement unconnected? No, not as an exact statement. Because you have this. So that's done by one open. So the larger limit L in this gate, bear the exact A propagator is the same as a bare The exact psi propagator is not the same as the exact psi propagator. I sorry, bare psi propagator, sorry. <laughs> but it's whatever it is. Okay? These are the two leftover gamma things. Is this clear? There are many. Actually, the cleanest way to derive this equation is through what's called a Schwinger desk equation. Um, I'll give this to you as an exercise. You take the path and take and then uh, uh, sort of in the way, method very similar to that that we used to obtain the equation of it, You write on the Schwinger desk equation for the, for the property. I will give you the to you as an exercise. Okay. And there's a clean derivation of this thing that doesn't it's not even diagrammatically, you see it very Is this clear? <coughs> is this equation clear? Right. Okay. So now, we're going to take this equation and process it. Okay. So we're going to take this equation and process the equation of it. How do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is the following. Um, firstly, we're going to take this object here and multiply it by, you know, this identity that we've got p slash plus m is a p slash minus m. That gives you p squared. So what we're going to do is to multiply this guy here, the sigma here, or whatever it is, um, is some two cross two matrix. We don't yet know what, it, what, what its matrix structure is, but it can be written in terms of linear combinations. Unfortunately, that's not for us. <laughs> uh, 
linear combinations of uh, gamma matrices as well as identity. Okay? So, whatever it is, we'll group the identity part with the M. We'll group the gamma matrix part with the K. And we'll use multiply and divide by such an object to make the denominator simple to get all the matrix structures enumerated. But now, whatever matrix structure we have is sandwiched between two gamma matrices. Now, gamma minus square is what?
plus 2 k minus k plus Okay, let's see how this works. You see, what we had here is purely proportional to gamma minus. What term here is purely proportional to gamma minus? Okay, the term here purely proportional to gamma minus is k plus. This is sky plus. Two minutes. Okay, so we had. You see, the free term is k plus gamma minus plus. K minus gamma plus because the metric is G plus minus is not there. Are you understand? Because you should contract it's K mu, gamma mu with a G mu mu. Okay? So the term proportional gamma minus with K plus. We've got another gamma minus. So whatever K plus here gets shifted by this sigma. Okay? In fact, I think it's an idea. So it gets shifted by i times sigma. Okay? And therefore, wherever you had k plus, so let's write this. And let's write this as uh, k minus k plus Plus. It's just that the k plus gets shifted by a sigma. Uh, you can ask why does it get shifted by two sigma? Does it get shifted by two sigma? So you, what is, it's this basically what is the Let me check whether it's shifted by sigma or two sigma. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 